is a moment coming when I won't be able to call you to service because I'll probably be in prison or I may already be with the Lord because it's becoming very unpopular to believe what we believe, to preach what we preach. And I'll tell you one thing, I may fail the Lord in a lot of ways, but one way I'm not going out of this world is by putting my hand on the plow and then looking back and thinking maybe I love this present world. I've already said goodbye. You hear me today? I've already said my goodbyes. When I go, I go. When I'm with him, I know I'm dead. I'm not going to know until it's over because I already decided I'm following Jesus. Last week, we got all up in the big middle of it with this story, and I'm just going to touch on it a little bit by way of reminder, Uh, reading from Joshua, the 22nd chapter, the 10th verse, the 12th verse, and the 34th verse, Joshua 22, 10, 12, and 34. When they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, all you need to know, three tribes were, or two and a half tribes, if you want to be technical about it, were uh, involved in this scenario. So these two and a half tribes and the sons of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, built an altar. So... Uh, just to be clear, when it says when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, that's where the Israelites have been trying to get since they left Egypt a generation before, right? And it should have only been a several days journey and human nature got involved and, and it got all jacked up for a generation and a half. And that's very relatable, in our world, isn't it? Very, very relatable. Uh, But when it says that they got to the region of the Jordan that's in the land of Canaan, just know that what it's telling you is they finally arrived at the banks of the promise. I told you last week the instruction from the Lord through the prophet Moses. Now, Moses is already dead at the time that we're reading this, and Joshua is leading the congregation, but the instructions of the Lord through Moses had been, when you get over there to that part of the Jordan, cross over, cross over onto the western bank, and there in the west bank, you'll start to take the land. And so uh, I, I, it, he, he told them, here's the borders of what you're going to divide between yourselves. And the Jordan ran as the border along that part. So they have arrived on the, the eastern bank of the Jordan that's not really supposed to be in the division of the land that's going to be inherited by the tribes. But it's an interesting thing about God. It always seems like it's, it's not just that his promises are yes. They're always yes, and then there's an amen on top of it. So he said there's going to be 12 tribes, and then he gave them a 13th, which happened to be two half tribes. So uh, if you go to bagel shops in New York, if they're worth their salt, they'll give you either 13 or now sometimes 14 Bagels for your baker's dozen. Now this is this is that just that little extra nudge to say, don't forget we took care of you. Don't forget we, we hooked you up. Just 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 remember us when the 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 it seems like the good stuff is running out, and then you find one more in the bottom of the bag. Remember who did that for you, right? And so when the Lord said 12 tribes, we wound up with 13, which could be 14, because one of those is two half tribes. And God is so magnificent in how he does things. Jesus has the 12 disciples and then you, you have this situation with 
Judas that takes place. And so they're down a disciple. When God replenishes that number, he doesn't give one for one. He gives two apostles for the loss of the one apostle. And we have the 12 apostles are the foundation of the church, but there's actually 13 of them. And so it's that kind of just, you see that kind of harmony over and over and over. We don't know much of anything about Matthias, the apostle, except he must have been very faithful. And he was chosen by the Holy Ghost. I've heard people throw all kinds of theories out there about he wasn't really the 13th or the 12th apostle because it was really Paul and all that. No, it says right there that it seemed good to them, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. They, they, the Holy Ghost spoke. I don't know what his deal was. I don't know exactly uh, what his ministry was like or any of that. I just know that when you are going to look at who gets a share in the 12 apostles, Paul and Matthias are going to have to get along because they got kind of jammed in there and they're sharing an inheritance. So the Lord looking all the way down through, he sees the end from the beginning, when he gave the tribes of Israel, he threw in that little baker's dozen with the extra little nod to two of them having to share one seat. Isn't God amazing the way he just orchestrates everything so that we get to understand his manifold wisdom. And so uh, that's what we're, we're dealing with here is that they've arrived on that eastern bank of the Jordan, which is not supposed to be part of their promise, but the Lord just gives them the kings and the cities along that bank anyway because he's good and because he's God and because he was there. And so while he was in the neighborhood, he took care of business. And so that's why we have so much emphasis in our church on the presence of the Lord in our midst. That's why we are striving every time we come together in service, we are striving to entertain his presence. We are fumbling our way through it, trying not to mess up anything he's doing, trying not to write him out of the liturgy by not giving him enough room to do his work. And, and, and now it's why we're going a step beyond just making room for the spirit of the living God that we can feel blow through this place and we can feel rest on the worshipers and the worship leaders and all of that. But we're trying to understand what it means to make room for the physical presence of the Lord. So when we, when we practice the Lord's Supper, when we receive communion, we are now understanding that just like we have entertained the spiritual presence of God in our midst, it is our duty to entertain the physical presence of Jesus in the gathering of his body of believers. And so now we know why wrath and envy and quarreling and all of those things have to cease and and you better not approach the lord's table with with bitterness on you or or not living right i'm going to tell you something cuz i've been saying it on communion sundays and i i'm not policing it i'm not policing it but i can feel in my spirit i can't think of one example of somebody that i know for a fact ain't right and came and took the cup and the bread, but I can feel in my spirit that we still don't have enough of the fear of the Lord about how we're approaching that. It's not a fear of being struck down. It's not any of that. The scariest thing that you can have happen to you in this world is to have the the protection of the hand of God lifted off of your life. And he'll do it as discipline when we need to wake up and smell the coffee. I, I, I have told my children over and over, don't stick something in the socket. But every now and then, or don't lick the battery or all those things, I, had, I never had to say that to the girls, and that's all I'll say about that. But every now and then, when I know the situation is completely controlled, and don't call CPS because you can't prove anything. 
when I know the situation is completely controlled and I see Brendan going to do something that he knows full well he's not supposed to be doing and I know that it's going to be unpleasant, I just let him do it. And then when he comes crying, you just go, sounds like a personal problem. Go talk to whoever told you it was okay to do that. You don't want the protecting hand of the Father lifted from your life. So I'm telling you now, because I want you to start preparing your heart for the next time we receive the Lord's Supper, I'm begging you, don't approach the Lord's table if you're not right. Go get right. Go get right. Because if you present as sons of God, that's children, doesn't mean it's not about your gender, it's, it's children of God. If you present as the heirs of Christ, with Christ in the kingdom, if you present that way, he will treat you that way. And if you ain't right and you receive the Lord's Supper, then he will assume that you want to get right right now. And he will give you opportunity to do that. He will let opportunity come into your life. The Apostle Paul said, when people receive the Lord's Supper and they're judged because they weren't right when they did it. They had bitterness, envy, un unrepented sin, whatever it is in their life. When they receive the Lord's Supper and judgment comes into their life, it's so that their soul will be saved. When he disciplines his children, it's not, he's not an abuser. He's not an abuser. But he is a disciplinarian because he's a father. And so when he disciplines us, he doesn't mind if it's extremely unpleasant, but he is determined not to leave a permanent scar. He won't do that to us. But you don't want that in your life because from his perspective, if it kills you in this life and yet your soul is saved in eternity. People say, I'm saved by grace. He's not going to let me out of his hand. Listen, first of all, we, we, can, we can bat scriptures back and forth on that all day. I wouldn't put all my eggs in the once saved, always saved basket because it's got a notorious couple holes in the bottom of it. But let's, let's give it to you. Let's say that you're right. Let's say once saved, always saved really is how it is. And really once saved, always saved is just an incredibly weak and, uh, man, I really can't give it a break, can I? I'm trying. But uh, let's just say that it's a very sloppy uh, and really inaccurate uh, way of stating a doctrine that has been a part of the Christian faith in many denominations, not ours, but many denominations, and it's a much more careful doctrine, and it's called the perseverance of the saints. Not once saved, always saved, but our Calvinist brothers and sisters have a doctrine that they call the, pers the perseverance of the saints, and it's a much more well-grounded doctrine because they understand, I've still got issues with it, but they understand that you being saved by grace is often not going to feel like grace. People that are, are saying once saved, always saved, they get the idea that I can run around, do all this, and, you know, just, just have a great time, and, and Jesus has to pay the bill. That's what that is. That's an entitlement mentality. Those are trust fund babies in the kingdom, assuming that there's no way to get written out of the will, and so they wrecking daddy's cars, and they're flipping the, the everything, and, and they're, they're shooting at each other, and, they're, and, and it's like, well, he's got to get the bill. He's got to, my, my big brother always pays for everything. My, he's got my dad's bank account and he always pays for everything. And somewhere I've watched people that are worth half a billion dollars look straight in their son's eye and say, that's it. I'm not paying for anything else. I'm done. You're, you're cut loose. Listen, you don't want to push those buttons, but it's a much more grounded doctrine to say, 
Man, he may turn your world upside down. He may bring judgment into your life. He may wreck you. He may allow you to completely shipwreck your life, and that's his grace. See, people say I'm saved by grace, but they don't they have a false understanding of what grace feels like. If you really understood how grace works in the life of a believer to deal with unrepentant sin, you'd stop leaning so hard into him covering the spread and you'd start leaning into living like the one that lived and died to pay the bill for you. It's not that I don't think grace can cover it. I know grace has to cover it. No matter what I do, it's still going to be grace that covers me. No matter if I manifest the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and all day, every day, and it's still going to be grace that covers me. I just don't want to run into that kind of oppositional grace where your father backhands you. I don't want to run into that kind of oppositional grace where he just says, fine, stick it in the socket, see what happens. I don't want to run into that. Okay, so that's a little, that's, that's a, 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 what looks like a little bit of a left turn, but I'm telling you, I came here today largely to put that warning into the ether for us. We need to understand that we would do much better to acknowledge that we are not currently in the condition of being a communicant in the Lord's family. We, it would be good for your soul to have to acknowledge that. And the dealings of the Lord would be infinitely lighter in your life. Some, I'm, oh man, I feel the Holy Ghost. I know this isn't going to make anybody run the aisles and all of that, but it, it, it might even make you mad and you might even not come back. But there's a chance we'll get to share eternity together and we wouldn't have if you didn't hear the word of truth. So I'm just going to tell you this like it is because I feel the Holy Ghost on it. Some of you think your life is crumbling around you and you think that you've fallen into sinful patterns and habits and behaviors because your life is crumbling around you. And I came here to tell you today that you've got it backward. You've put the cart before the horse. You need to go like the psalmist said, search me, O God, and try my ways. See if there be any wicked way in me. Because if you let him forensically roll back the clock for you, you will find out that it wasn't him that left you in twisting in the wind. It was you that left him and went to twist in the wind. And so I'm telling you right now, there's some of you that feel like your life is falling apart around you, and it's not. It's just that God has stopped trying to bless and prosper you in this life as his child, and he is now concerned with the preservation of your eternal well-being because you have forced his hand. I want to bless my children. I want to play sports with them. I want to have a good time. I want to go get snow cones. But if they're going to throw a fit in the middle of the house and cause an issue, guess what? We're not playing nothing today. We're not going nowhere today. We're not going to get any sugar and die for you. And we're not doing any of that because you need your attitude corrected. So, I'm, I, I, I mean, I, he won't let me pass this. Y'all, some of you need to ask the Lord, show me where I went off the rails. And you will see that it was you that moved first, not him. So they arrive there they, 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 at the side of the Jordan where he's just throwing it in for for you know, to just to prove that he's good and he's a good father and he's given them all these cities. And, and there they built an altar by the Jordan, a large altar in appearance. Say those five words with me, a large altar in appearance. It looked big, right? It looked big. Then dropping down, when the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. Now, hold on a second. I, these two and a half tribes, they're in the congregation of the sons of Israel, right? These are the children of Israel we're talking about. Very interesting that the way this story is written, the ones across the Jordan are referred to as 
Manasseh, Gad, Reuben, and the other nine, or nine and a half, are referred to as the uh, sons of Israel. What's the writer doing? The writer is making sure we remember that a point of division has arisen between them, right? When the sons of Israel heard of the altar that had been built, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh. Shiloh is the first place the Lord ever chose for his tabernacle to reside permanently. Shiloh was the first place that there was ever a permanent uh a permanent holy of holies. There was ever a permanent administration of the priesthood. And it's my belief, because it's our bishop's belief, and when you submit yourself to somebody for a decade, some of their beliefs start to rub off on you. It's my belief, because it's bishop's belief, that the tabernacle of David will be restored in some way that includes Shiloh in a very... Um, a, a very clear prophetic way. Now, there's a whole discussion to be had about what that's going to look like. I'm, the, I'm just saying the Lord loves Shiloh. It's a place where he wanted his glory to rest. It's connected with Jerusalem. It has a whole lot to do with what he has planned for the, the years coming up. Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh. Why? Because that's where their altar was. That's where the, the approved altar, the sanctioned altar, that's where the altar that the denomination knew about was. That's where the altar that the bishops had okayed was. That's where the altar that we have at the, at the, the church, uh, where the church gathers, that's Shiloh. So they gathered there to go up against these two and a half tribes in war for building an unauthorized altar. The sons of Reuben dropping down and the sons of Gad called the altar witness. For they said, it's a witness between us that the Lord is God. Last week, I preached to you about the offensive altar. And I just wanted to put a bug in your ear today about a few of the characteristics of the offensive altar. A few of the characteristics of the offensive altar. Because what, what bottom line, last week we asked the question, why were the rest of the tribes going to come up to war against these for building an altar to the Lord? And we went and found the answer in Deuteronomy where the Lord said, if you hear that a tribe is building an altar, it's probably about the local deities. It's probably about wanting a place to rub shoulders with the, the society and the elite of the area. Always remember that. I had some of our ministers even tell me in the last week, I, I hadn't really realized that that was the purpose of the pagan places of worship uh, in, in that time period. And so I'm going to reiterate that probably every time we talk about it, because I, I need you to understand that they were not cavemen. I need you to understand these people we're reading about, they are not ignorant barbarians. That's not why they keep wanting to go back to have their idols and have their little, their little, you know, connections and all that. No, it is entirely because when people share the worship of a deity that can be held and, and placed on an, a nice altar and adorned and, and, and fetishized is the word and can be admired and you can have a nicer statue in your house than so-and-so has in their house and you can build one out of marble and everybody's going to want to come see it. And when you do that, and we see that in the modern world, for instance, with happy Buddha. So there are some that are, are little and it just, it kind of works as a way when you walk in the restaurant and there's a happy Buddha sitting on the counter. It kind of tells you this is who th these people are affiliated with. But then sometimes you go somewhere and their statue is breathtaking. It's beautiful and it's, it's massive and it's made of something amazing. And what does that do? That draws the attention of everybody affiliated with that faith to that place. 
Oh, I wish you could understand right now. That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is a form of saying, I worship God while actually receiving the glory yourself. Idolatry is a form of saying, I'm giving a sacrifice while actually taking the benefit for yourself because your friends and your neighbors and your golf buddies, they all want to come see the little altar that you put up and they're going to put their little gifts on it and everything. And, but, bottom line is that you're the one that's going to get to make a business deal with them. You're the one that's going to get to put your kids in that very exclusive school because your little idol kind of made them feel impressed and, and then they wanted to show you their little idol. And, and so, so do you understand that the fundamental nature of idolatry is the worship of a God, but in, a, in an underhanded way that gives me the benefit and me the glory and me the honor, which means we have to be very, very, very careful when we minister in the presence of the living God. Somebody stood on this platform not long ago and just absolutely blew the vocals out the, I mean, it was just like mind numbing watching the, the vocals that were coming from them. And I, 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 I couldn't help but be impressed. And not only that, but I found myself while I was trying to pray and worship, I find myself constantly drawn to and thinking, my God, that run. Like, how many times do you have to practice that to do that run? And then I noticed someone else on our platform leading worship at the same time who I knew for a fact had the skill set to be doing all of that. And I hadn't even noticed them before. And when I turned and looked at the one that had the skill set but wasn't doing it, she was on her knees with her arms lifted, her tears pouring down her face. She had broken her vial on the feet of Jesus. And what was happening between them was happening on this platform, but it was in no way, shape, or form set on a stage. It was between her and Jesus. And the rest of us, if we wanted to, could take advantage of the atmosphere like Joshua, who hung out in the tent of meeting long after Moses and the Lord had ceased talking face to face, because we get to benefit from the atmosphere that exists around people who have that kind of personal relationship and worship with God. And I thought to myself, if anybody asks us what the standard to be allowed to minister on this platform is, as many times as you ask, I'm going to give you the same answer. If you want to be used more here, let your consecration grow. You don't have to do it in such a way that we all, you know, are going to be glued to you or whatever, but just know this, if you'll do it in secret and do it for him, he will put a light on you in public. There's a lot of people in this church that have questions about why some people get used more than others and have questions about maybe, you know, well, what's the deal with so-and-so and have questions about, well, what, should we uh, hire this in? Or Listen, if you feel God's given you a gift and you feel like it's not being used, to its fullest potential, of course, hone your craft, grow in all of that. But the biggest thing you could do, the number one thing you could do is you could grow in your consecration. You got to build that altar. You got to work on that altar at home. You got to work on that altar that I don't see every day. You got to work on that altar because eventually if you build it strong enough and you build it big enough, word will start to get out and somebody will start to talk and and it'll probably be some mess. They'll start to talk about your little altar. And then I'll have to come as the shepherd and take a look in the spirit and see what we're talking about. And the, 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 the deep in me that is surrendered to him will talk to the deep in you that surrender to him. And they that know the Lord know each other and know that we are born of him because we know the kind of love that comes from that. So you want to advance? Grow your consecration. Grow your consecration. The people that lead solos here on the platform, 
uh, from week to week. Sometimes we have a guest come through, and, and we may not even know until we've had them what that's going to be like. But the ones you see coming back over and over, whether they are people that, that we bring in from the outside or whether they are our leaders from within, the people that you see consistently being used in those ways if you want to know why it's them, it's because of consecration. If you want to know why it's them, it's because of consecration. I want to be the best at everything we do, but I am determined to give the best to the one who has given us everything. So when they came to fight with them over that altar, and I don't know if we'll keep going in this or not, I don't know. We can have music because I'm coming toward the end. I, I was listening to Times Square Church again this morning, and Pastor Tim said something that tickled me so hard I almost wrecked the car. He said, musicians come and play second point music. And then he reiterated that. He said, play music for the preachers at the second point. And he, I, I got so tickled because what it means is he hit time, and he was supposed to stop. So if he just said, ministers come and play music they were going to play him off the stage off the platform but he didn't say that he said play second point music I'm kind of saying that we got about five minutes that I'd like to bring this in for a landing don't play me off just play me through so What had happened is after they'd taken the promised land, we talked about this last week, after they'd taken the promised land and these people that received their inheritance on that bonus side of the Jordan, after they had gone and fought everybody else's battle, Joshua looked at them and said, you did what you promised the Lord you would do. And now he's given your brothers rest on every side. Everybody has inheritance. Everybody has a place to hang their hat, somewhere to till their land, somewhere to grow their flocks. Take your share of the spoils of war. He said, make sure you load your wagons down heavy because you please God. Go back home and check on your families and see how your flocks and your herds are doing and Go enjoy yourselves. It was such a, a beautiful moment and a, a rewarding moment, but as they turned to leave, his voice changed a little bit, and he got that threatening voice the preacher gets sometimes. He said, but you better be careful because you're going a little further away than the rest of the flock. That's how I feel when people tell me, Pastor, I got a second job. It's going to make it harder for me to be there on Sunday. Okay. You've been faithful. You fought in this altar with us for the souls of our city. You've, you've brought your tithe to the Lord's house. You've been at first Monday and first Wednesday. You, you've been faithful. Go see to your flocks and herds. Go see to your family's business. But be careful. Be careful. Because the, the sad end to many a story starts with a phrase like that. I picked up a little extra work. or But the heart is so deceptive, sometimes it's hard to tell if we're really talking about this is just one of the necessities of life and the Lord knows and he'll give you grace? Or are we talking about your priorities are subtly falling out of line and becoming more like the people around you? Which is why the Lord had said in Deuteronomy, if you hear that a tribe or a clan has built an altar other than the authorized altar at Shiloh, go check it out. And if it is what it sounds like it is, that their priorities have flipped, that they joined the country club, that they're doing what it takes to close a deal or get their kids into a better school, if it 
is what it sounds like it is, you don't just destroy the altar, destroy all the animals in that place because they were going to be possibly sacrificed to that false god. You got to kill everybody. You got to tear down that. You got to uproot that out of the midst of my people. Uh, now our battle is not with flesh and blood. So what the way we would read that now is if you hear that a brother or sister seem to be doing most of their worshiping at home, they, 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 they're not making it to the assembly of the saints as often. They say they're still a believer. They say nothing's changed. You better go check that out. You better go check that out because you're your brother's keeper. And if, if, if it's true that they are slipping on their priorities, if, if, if it's true that they have allowed an opportunity in Little League to cloud their judgment. And now they are saying with their mouth, I put the Lord first, but they are living with their life in front of their kids that the Lord comes first unless he messes with my probably unhinged plans to put you in the, the major leagues and see you have this great, great, I mean, maybe, maybe you'll be one of the 0.2% of people that does that. It's, it's possible, but it is almost, it is almost without, uh, uh, it's almost without question that in reordering your priorities that way, you are going to have a child come from your home that spends the rest of their life thinking the Lord comes first unless it's inconvenient. The Lord comes first unless there's a better opportunity. This is why he says if you go find out that really is true. That altar at home, that offensive altar really is a distraction. Then you better, help, man, you better get to hewing on it. You better tell your friend, we got to pray. We got to pray because I know there was a day when you wouldn't have done that. I know there was a day when you would have felt conviction. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God said, you make sure that thing gets torn down because it'll get somebody. And so I, I, I came to tell you today that, that when they came to check on this offensive altar they were relieved to find out the altar was not what they were worried that it was I told you last week they said well we built this altar maybe we'll develop it out next week if the Lord keeps letting us mess with it they said well we built this altar because we were worried that your little religious raised in the church kids would come talk to our poor little lived a little far from everybody else kids had a home group because we didn't always make it to the big house kids not i'm not talking about i'm lazy i live five miles from the church and i have a perfectly good car and i'm doing that i'm talking about I'm talking about Debbie Hill. I'm talking about I live two states away, and so I'm there every Sunday. This is the spirit-filled, Bible-believing church that I got. De Debbie's children that live beyond driving distance uh, on a regular basis from here, and they show up every week. I'm talking about Cheryl Fowler, who can't leave the facility she's in, but here faithfully every Sunday. I'm talking about... The children that are raised up right here going to them and saying, you don't have a part in what God did at Promised Land because you were geographically a little bit removed. They said, we got worried your children would do that, so we built us an altar in our home. And I'm just going to run through the list real quick so you can think about it, and maybe we'll preach it out next week. It was not built to replace the altar at the Tabernacle of Meeting. Can I hear an Amen. It was the product of personal consecration. It was built out of a, a determination and a desire to model at home what we tell our children we believe in at the temple. And it was built to, to it was modeled after the altar at Shiloh because they needed to know that their children's children's children, if they were ever trying to figure out where my family really goes home to worship, who is our family's 
God. It couldn't look like the altar of Baal. It couldn't look like the altar of Ashtoreth next door. It couldn't look like the battle of pa- the, the, the altar of Peor a few miles down the road that almost got everybody killed when Balaam, the false prophet, came into the camp. It, 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 it had to look like the altar at Shiloh because my kids have to see at home something that they will recognize when they come in wherever this place is meeting. So when they walk in, they have to be able to say, this, this is what I was raised in. This is what my parents were always modeling. That's how they prayed. That's how they fasted. That's how they lived. That's how they dated. That's how they married. That's how they loved each other. That's how they took care of people's needs. That's how they loved the lost. That's how they shared the gospel. That's how they spoke in tongues. This is what I was raised in. And it had to be built large because it had to be easily visible when their children were far off. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Some of us, we've been building our altar for a long time at home. The offensive altar that doesn't quite fit in at church. It means that I have to get up at a certain time every day because that's not one of the rules. But because otherwise I won't have time to build my altar with the Lord. It means that I have to have certain rules in my life. When, when, when somebody messages me, slips in my DMs, usually looking for ministry. Almost always looking for ministry. Ministry, uh, and they, they, they roll up in my DMs and, they, and it's usually 100% innocent, but they're from the opposite sex, then they will get a reply from me most always, unless for some reason I'm very personally comfortable with them, which can be a danger. But I mean, if it's Mama Joyce, she's going to get away with it. But otherwise, they'll get a reply back from me and Pastor Brooke. It's not that hard to copy your wife in when when you're sending DMs to somebody because guess what? I'm not worried just about evil. I'm worried about the appearance of evil. I need my altar to be big enough that my children can see it and their children can see it. I'm not just trying to get by and I also know if I don't build my altar strong enough, they built it to last. I also know that if I don't build it strong enough, if I'm not faithful enough to prayer, if I'm not committed enough to the Lord's tithe, if I'm not uh, at the, 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 the Lord's uh, uh, table every time I have an opportunity, if I don't do these things in a way that is, is strong and vibrant, I know that my heart can slip and I can lose my heritage before I even leave this mortal coil. I'm done. It was more spiritual than it was religious, the offensive altar. Because it was a safeguard for relationship. A lot of y'all say, I'm not religious. I have a relationship. Half that statement is true in your case. You're right, you're not religious. You don't have much of a relationship. That's the truth. The truth is, if your soul was required of you tonight, you're not confident that he would even say he knows you. How can you go 12 more hours like that? My children said to me, when the... uh, I guess it was when Pastor Brooke was preaching the other day. Oh, I'm so relieved. In Sunday school, we have to sit for 30 minutes when our lessons are done, when you're preaching. Because you're always going over. I said, for seven years, I preached on a clock that gave me 35 minutes on a good day with bishops sitting behind me, closing me down as I read my opening verse. And I did not go over but one time. I went, thank you. I don't even get that at home. I didn't go over but one time. I 
think we'll get back to normal. But I keep hearing from people, it wouldn't be so hard you going over all the time if we didn't start at 1130. I get it. I get it. <sighs> but it scares me as your pastor that that's the level of inconvenience required to make it possible for you to feel, I don't know, I, I love promised land, but I don't know if I want to go every Sunday because pastor shows be going over 20 minutes. That's the level that it takes for you to not have time to come to the altar before you leave? What is your prayer life like at home? Let me tell you something. If you take me to Gold's Gym tonight, I'll go with you because I know I need to. But I will wear out in about 20 minutes. You know why? Because I don't do it at home. When you see somebody repping and doing their, you know, art, whatever it is, deadlifts, leg day, and you see them just crushing it, you're not looking at them doing a great job that day. You're looking at the aggregation of a lifestyle of commitment, of going without, of pushing through the pain, of doing the reps anyway, of, of gritting your teeth, of having trainers yell in your ear, are you really going to give up that fast? I thought you came here to work out. I thought you came here to get fit. And as your pastor, there's something about it that I, I'm going to tell you this if you want to know the psychology of what's going on. I'm going to keep going over like this until you quit noticing. As long as we're getting this pushback, the trainer in me says, we got to run another lap. The trainer in me says, we got to do another rep. The trainer in me says, we got to build up some strength. If you can't run with, the, if the footmen have wearied you, how will you contend with the horsemen? I came to tell you, there is a moment coming when I won't be able to call you to service because I'll probably be in prison or I may already be with the Lord because it's becoming very unpopular to believe what we believe, to preach what we preach. And I'll tell you one thing, I may fail the Lord in a lot of ways, but one way I'm not going out of this world is by putting my hand on the plow and then looking back and thinking maybe I love this present world. I've already said goodbye. You hear me today? I've already said my goodbyes. When I go, I go. When I'm with him, I know I'm dead. I'm not going to know until it's over because I already decided I'm following Jesus. You don't have to be seated. You can do whatever you want because we're done. Respond the way the Holy Ghost prompts you to respond. That altar is more spiritual than it is religious because it's a safeguard for relationship. But most of y'all relationship people would call it religious. Do you hear me right now? You wouldn't like the offensive altar any better than anybody else liked it. You would misunderstand it too. Most of you that say, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, have neither a religion nor a relationship. Let me tell you something, you better hope you've got religion. It's going to be religion that's going to save your sorry behind when the clouds are rolling back, when the horsemen of the apocalypse are running through the land. But I understand what you mean, and I agree with the spirit of what you mean, but it's going to be relationship that's going to keep you held fast to that old gospel ship we call true religion. Nothing else is going to keep you there. I'm going to tell you something after 20 years, 
years of being with me, the reason Brooke Hirsch will be in my house tonight is not because of the formality of our vows. Ask my children, if it were that easy as saying a takesy backsies, she would have been gone a long time ago, and so would I have if I'm honest about it. But you won't see that happening because what's holding me home and what's holding her home is not the legalities of our vows. It's this relationship we have forged out of the fire of trying to make it together in this world and raise some children. Most of you would say that altar was religious. You'd say it had a religious spirit. You'd say you don't have to have that at home. God never said you had to have that at home. That's religious. You're judging me. No, it's relationship. It's a relationship thing. If you had a relationship, you'd understand why I may forget to put on my watch, but I don't forget to put on my ring, except on the days when my finger swells and it won't fit. If you had a relationship, you'd understand why I need some visible markers of it to remind me and remind my children and remind everybody else. That altar is more spiritual than it is religious. But a lot of you would say it was religious because you don't like accountability. You don't like being held to an accountability. Let me tell you something. That's not a religious spirit. That's a spirit of conviction that you're bristling against. The offensive altar was misunderstood, but it wasn't misused. It was not used to, to, to tell themselves we don't have to, we can forsake the assembling. That's what the Israelites were stirred up about. They thought, you don't want to travel all the way to Shiloh anymore, and we get it, but you're the ones that wanted to live over there. No, no, no. They said, it's not for us to do at home what we're supposed to do with the gathered body of believers. It's so that we do at home the things that will make the body of believers recognizable to us. It was misunderstood, but it wasn't misused. So I feel the Holy Ghost. I need to say one more thing to you, and then we're going to come to this altar. Listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus, why would you, why would you miss another day without doing that? Anything that can make grown adults act like this is probably worth checking out. <laughs> You're looking at people that... A lot of the folks you see praising their socks off in here won't let a hair fly out of place in their day to day. We're not doing all that because we love doing all that. We're doing all that because we don't know how else to react to what he's done for us, who he is, how he's brought us through. So get ready to respond, church. I need people. I'm not going to beg for it this week. I'm not going to beg for it. I need people who don't care that we've been getting out of here at 1.30, 1.45. I need people who are determined to see an altar built in their home. I need people who will think of people in this church that used to have an altar, but they didn't build it big enough, and they didn't make it look enough like the one at church. They didn't commit themselves to enough of the things that God requires, and so now their altar has been torn down, and they've lost sight of it. I need people that will think of those names, not in judgment, but to come down here and to get on your face and say, Oh, God, let them see the altar that you and me are building. Please let them see the altar I'm working on with my family and let it remind them of who they are and whose they are. God, don't let it be me that didn't have an altar you could see and so they didn't remember and they didn't come to themselves. I need people who will do warfare for your family, for our church, for the next batch of souls coming in. I need you in two minutes to meet me in this altar. And I'm not going to beg for it. I'm just going to leave the opportunity open. 
But I need to say right now to a couple of people, yes, that's good. Respond if you feel so led. I need to say right now to a few people that need to hear the preacher's heart today. Please don't reject me. Please don't reject me out of hand. Please don't get angry and walk out. If I make you mad in the next 20 seconds, please come talk to Jesus about it before you react. There are people in this church that have suddenly taken to living a lifestyle of open sin where they used to have consecration. And I'm telling you today, this is the last place you're ever going to go to be judged and looked down on. I'm not worried about judging you. I've got enough to deal with trying to judge myself and stay in grace. But I am worried about the fact that your father has a habit of judging us for the sake of saving our souls. He disciplines us strongly. And I'm concerned that you're coloring outside the line of the hand of God in your life and that's why I'm begging you don't come down here in your sin and receive the Lord's Supper don't come down here and pretend to be someone you're not but by the same token I'm begging you if I've offended you today if I've made you mad today please come down and talk to Jesus there's always room at Calvary for everybody especially those of you who have somehow lost your way. We're not going to stop preaching against fornication just because you're enjoying this season of your life. We're not going to stop telling you the truth that God says about marriage and life and family just because you found somebody on an app. But I will tell you this. We're going to love you. We're going to honor you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you. But we're all also going to keep working on these altars we're building. I want you every time you come to church to see the consecration around you and go home knowing for a fact that's what I belong to. That's where I'm supposed to be. And when you're a long ways off and you're shacked up and everything's gone tipsy-turvy in your life, I want you to be able to look up and see the altar we have built in our living room and know that there is a God in Israel and that when you're ready, you can leave the pig pen and come home. Let's just seek the Lord right now. Thank you, Father.